about where technology is going and the impact it will have on business. And the types of models and projections that I've devised to help me with my own business because that is the reason I got into technology forecasting. One of the key points I want to make is that it's not just a factor of computation and communication, but it actually will affect every industry. And it's about over a thousand drug developments in the pipeline to turn genes off, add new genes, turn on and off enzymes, really reprogram the software that runs in our bodies, just the way you reprogram your computer. There are already people walking around with computers in their bodies and brains. If you're a Parkinson's patient, you can have a computer put in your brain that replaces the biological neurons destroyed by that disease, and it actually works quite well. And uh, if you ask these people, that computer in your brain, is that just some computer that happens to be put in your brain because it's a convenient place to put, put it, or is that part of you? Uh, you get different answers from different people, but generally they'll say, no, that's part of me, that's part of who I am. They are now a cyborg. And the latest generation of this neural implant actually allows you to download new software to the computer inside your brain from outside the patient. And this is a pea-sized computer. It requires surgery today to implant, but if you consider that 25 years from now, these technologies will be a billion times more powerful, 100,000 times smaller, because we're shrinking these technologies by a factor of 100 in 3D volume per decade, uh, you get some idea of what will be feasible. But the overall impact of these information technologies is amazingly good. And if you can measure the overall power of these technologies, for example, the price performance of computing, it follows these exquisitely smooth exponential progressions. In the era of computing, it's over 110 years. Very smooth exponential growth. It used to mean that these trends were so slow that you could ignore them, you could assume that growth would be linear, you didn't really have to take the exponential into account. Two or three years from now, there'll be kind of steady progress, but not explosive progress. These trends are now so fast, and the, the rate of technological change is so quick that typical business and technology planning cycle of three years, four years, five years, the world will be a completely different place. A straight line is a good approximation of an exponential progression for a short period of time. It's a very bad projection for a long period of time. And most government models are based on linear extrapolations of current trends. So there's a big debate in my country that Social Security will run out of money in 2027. And all of the assumptions built into those models are based on linear extensions of today's trends. This is actually the measure of the innovation, the invention, the entrepreneurship of millions of people and thousands of companies in dozens of countries on every continent. And, and, and despite all kinds of human history, you see this very smooth, very predictable progression. If information technology has a 50% inflation rate, and the portion of the economy devoted to information technology is expanding, uh, and that and it will be most of the economy by the 2020s, then the economy will have this 50% inflation rate, and people are not going to double their consumption year after year to keep up with this, so the size of the economy will shrink, at least as measured in constant currency. And for a variety of actually sound reasons, that's not a good thing. But that's actually not what we see. We actually more than double our consumption every year. And the reason is that as price performance reaches certain critical levels, whole new applications explode in the landscape. I mean, people didn't buy iPods for $10,000. In five years, it'll reach a tipping point where solar energy is less expensive than fossil fuels. And I believe within 20 years, we, we could convert the entire world economy to very inexpensive solar energy. And we have plenty of solar energy. In fact, we have 10,000 times more than we need to meet all of our energy. There's artificial intelligence all around us. Every time you place a cell phone call, send an email, intelligent algorithms with the information, intelligent algorithms fly and land airplanes, guide intelligent weapon systems, make billions of dollars of intelligence, financial decisions every day, detect credit card fraud, automatically diagnose electrocardiogram, other disease states, blood cell images, help design products, help manufacture products in robotic factories. I'm involved in one company that actually has a robot that can actually see what it's doing. Uh, it doesn't it can work in an unstructured environment. Uh, intelligent algorithms control just-in-time inventory levels. 
and so on. There are hundreds of examples of software doing what used to be done by humans, using their human intelligence and doing it at human levels or beyond. It's narrow artificial intelligence because these systems perform a specific task that's useful. They don't have the full <coughs> suppleness. They don't have a sense of humor and other endearing qualities of humans. It's narrow artificial intelligence, but the narrowness is gradually getting less narrow. And the source of how to create more intelligent systems is going to come and is coming from the human brain itself. It's not hidden from writers, but this is not an alien invasion of these intelligent machines in these places so to compete with us or to fight with us. This is really part of our civilization. We are already a human machine civilization. We're already expanding our intelligence. We have at our fingertips access to all human knowledge with search engines uh, right in our pockets. This will ultimately be inside our brain. We're actually the only species in the world that does that, that expands our potential, that goes beyond our limitations. We didn't stay in the ground, we didn't stay in the planet, and we haven't stayed with the limitations of our biology. And this is the last point I'll make. Uh, we've been expanding human potential. You know, when our genes evolved a thousand years ago, it was not in the interest of the other species to live that long. And according to my models, within 15 years from now, we'll be ending more than a year every year, not just the infant life expectancy, but to your remaining life expectancy. As you go forward a year, your life expectancy will move on away from you. So if you can hang in there, increasingly businesses are not just in your local area. You've got people all over the country, all over uh, Europe, all over the world. Uh, there are increasingly powerful collaboration tools, which are not that expensive, where people can feel just like they're together, uh, even if they're far apart, and also share information and designs and three-dimensional visualizations. And that's really a worthwhile thing to invest in. You can take an email attachment and turn it into a solar panel or a module for housing or a blouse. Almost anything you need in the world. They'll be very inexpensive. There'll be open source versions of these things. You can actually live quite comfortably uh, through open source uh, types of things. That's where we're headed. We're headed towards an all information economy. That means the end of factories and just having design centers? Right. We'll actually achieve the goals of communism, which was such a failure to methods of forced collectivism. Uh, if you remember, the goal was from each according to their need, to each according to their, uh, well, to each according to their need, from each according to their ability, uh, through this uh, combination of open source information and proprietary information with these nanotechnology assemblers where we can really create the physical products we need at very low cost from information files.